All right. Good to be back. I'm yeah. Excited. Welcome back. How was Italy, man? Italy was incredible. It was really fun to be there with the family. Good weather. We had travel problems on both ends, but when we were actually in Italy, it was phenomenal. Where, where did you go? Went to Rome and Florence, Cinque Terre, and Venice. That's amazing. Yeah, my my you know two teenage boys. They'd never seen Rome. Had they uh, ever never seen, seen any of it? Never seen any of it. I was no, about to say right, never seen any of it. Yeah, right. that's that's right. awesome, man. Yeah. Um, well, we have a ton to And talk it was about. great. I really, David was incredible. You, it was a good job oh, with yeah. me being on. Well, it's, you know, look, if you if you pick great people to talk to, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's he's a wealth easy. of knowledge. He's, yeah. he's fantastic. And it's it's such a such a pivotal time in the industry right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so he's he's such a good person. And we'll, and we'll have more. We'll have more great people on. Um, but you did a yeoman's job while I was in Dublin meeting uh, the, the good people at Cardinal Health this week, pulling together yes. the show this yeah, week. So. Dublin, Ohio. Yes, Dublin, Ohio, <laughs> yeah. to be clear. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, which I had a great time. So just shout out and thanks to all the people at Cardinal. Um, incredible organization. Yeah, and uh, And yeah, it was great to learn. It, you know, it's a complex organization. So it's great to be there and learn from leadership, like exactly what they're doing there. Yeah. And um, it's it's a lot. And it's also, it's a, I mean, I, I feel like when you, when you do that, we talk so much about providers, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's really helpful to remember there's all this underlying support ecosystem yeah. that makes healthcare work. And well, when uh, they go to the cabinet and pull out materials, Cardin well, one of the three big suppliers right. that's Ex- delivered. Exactly. Cardin does a lot of that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so just like getting getting anchored in that yeah. truth and that reality, I think is is helpful. Mm-hmm. Is really helpful. All right, but you've pulled together a great show, and and it's, it's a lot of news this week. It well, is a big it's, news it's, week. it's another big it's another big Fed week, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. you know we've got we've got inflation news, and and uh, we actually have some some real movement on that front for the first time. Yeah. I, you know, I, I would say it's been moving, but this this week's uh, this week's print CPI print really does feel to me uh, like it's it's the the turning point, maybe, you know, maybe we're at the halfway point in this, of this overall journey. Uh, it's been a year, right? It's yeah. been a year since the Fed really started activating uh, the hikes. And what 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 are, yeah. we, what are we seeing here? Well, I mean, uh, I was just talking to someone at lunch today that listens to us while he jogs. So let's describe it a little bit. So yeah. um, this is CPI from 2020 to now. And what we're looking at is it went up over 8% at the peak of inflation Mm -hmm. when we all were spending our stimmy checks and buying (laughs) large big screen TVs and new cars. Um, And it's come down dramatically. The the headline is down at 3%, which is not two, but pretty damn close to two. Right. Um, And core is core. It's still stubborn. It's called core because it's not as volatile. Yeah. But it is um, going down. But it's going down. Yeah. yeah. It is going down. So I think I think that that three percent headline number on its way to two um is while it may not be the stubborn labor piece from a from a narrative perspective, which really influences the market, right? Mm-hmm. This is a politically friendly number, I think. Yeah. Right. Um it's politically friendly. Uh Wall Street loved it. I mean, the day it came out, the market was up a right, ton. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I would, I'd venture to say that the Fed is not going to get to two. Yeah, so like, yeah, it looks know. like it's on the way to two sharply, but it, it gets it well, starts I mean, for core. Right, yeah. right, right. Oh yeah, no, the core is not getting to two. Right, that's so not it, happening. I mean, the Fed won't come out and say this, but my guess is that there's there's no chance they're getting to two. Right. Ever. I mean, for a long time. Right. Right. And so this. This is it's really good improvement. Yeah, it's good. It's it's uh, it's good news. Certainly, we we welcome it, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, bring yeah. bring an end to this pain we're living in. Uh, <laughs> really right. nice. Right. Um, okay. So so then we have some jobs have, numbers, yeah, right? The jo- so there's two jobs reports. ADP kind of front runs uh, BLS. So the, right. the the official report comes out. Um, I think it's on the seventh or something. And okay. The day before. ADP that of course does a lot of payroll processing. Yep. A couple of years ago, they started front running that and giving people kind of a preview. It's of course not as robust as the government survey, but interesting. And so it was really a lot of jobs created. I mean, the leisure and hospitality added 
230, 2,000 jobs in the it's month. Incredible. That's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, a lot of months, that's the entire market. Uh, and not many sectors lost. And so overall, it was 400 something, a uh, really unexpectedly large amount of hiring, which is good. It makes some people nervous about inflation, but but we'll see. I, I like the people. People getting hired is good. Yeah, I mean, I I know my friends at the at the CVC love to see that leisure and hospitality number yeah, jumping right, up like that. Right. Um, that's great. All right. So then BLS. Then the official uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics came out, and that was also good. Not quite as strong. This is the sector by sector um, categories, and what what I thought was interesting is that. Um, education is sort of grouped in with with health services, so it's not totally clear. We can't get just health by itself, but from the government's point of view, that was the biggest job growth area, healthcare, which is which is great to see mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then go to the next one, which is the summary one. And so here, it, this is their summary statistic: two hundred and nine thousand jobs, uh, which is not as robust an estimate as ADP, right? But certainly. Not job losses, stable. I see a kind of a stabilization at that two hundred thousand a year a month kind of level for for six months. Now there was one month when it jumped up a little more, but we have stabilized. I think at job job growth, which is which is good. Probably a healthy number. We, I mean, a thousand jobs at the peak there in February is is not nine hundred is too much. Probably too hot. So we've. We've spent the vast majority of our time putting this podcast together for the last three or so months um, talking about the durable inflation levels around labor. Yeah. Um, we're seeing growth in jobs. We're seeing energy come, costs come down significantly. Um, what, you know, what does this mean in terms of the economy stabilizing such that we can do what we want to do as, as venture investors? I mean, I, I sort of see that there's going to be a couple of different scenarios going forward, but I think we should cover the the banking changes. Okay, all so, right. So, I mean, the way I see this is pricing is coming down from the from the uh, peak. Maybe go to the next one with retail sales. Yeah, I love this chart. So if you're if you're just listening, this chart should be the reason why. Yeah, I mean, we'll, go we'll, on we'll, go we'll, on YouTube and check out this chart. Yeah, you need to check out this chart. All right. So this is uh, a group called Red Book. They um, they measure retail sales weekly, and so it's a it's very often I mean, every week it comes out. Yeah, and it you know it was kind of it's it's an index thing, uh, so it's kind of relative, but forever for this is back to oh one, it was in the kind of you know zero to six as far as like growth you know moderate retail sales, and then in the oh nine. Um, you know, great financial crisis. It went went down negative. People didn't buy anything those several weeks in 2009 when it was scary, and then of course in the pandemic there were there was a month or two when no one was doing retail shopping. Um, but what's really interesting is since the pandemic, you so see the stimulus checks and kind of the reopening. Everyone bought all kinds of stuff at retail, mm -hmm. kind of pent up demand. And also the government sending money out and e-commerce and, and e what yeah, else? What right. else you got to do? Just home, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Everyone is sort of getting back to uh, life again, and I think that drove a. My opinion is that drove a lot of the inflation. The supply chain was not ready. Everyone tried to buy at the same time. Uh, if people are listening, it it goes up to almost eighteen, so it's like a three x peak. I don't think we have ever seen. I don't think Red Book has ever seen that. This this chart only goes back to 01, but I don't think it's, it's ever insane. been that high. It's insane. Yeah, visually, it's 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 yeah. obviously a mess. Yeah, it's a huge uh, peak buying of stuff. But the but now it has come down. The headline is dramatically. it's reverted to the mean. Like well, it's, well, it's gone negative. So for oh, the it first, has crossed. It has it crossed, crossed negative. into negative yes. territory. Yes, and um, that's probably not. It's totally sustainable, but certainly it's, it's gone a long way. Yeah, so it's but, but way that, down. that negative is a little bit probably a blip, right? It's probably now going to bounce around the middle again, right? Yeah, I mean, hopefully. I mean, what we'd like to see is this come back to the more healthy, you know, moderate growth, right? 
And the question is, is the Fed rate tightening going to allow that with credit card expenses being yeah. up and, yeah. you know, maybe uh, not people don't have as much savings as they had after the pandemic. I don't know. We'll see. But I, I think it's interesting to watch the retail almost as like a leading indicator of where the economy is going. How do you think the Fed? I mean, because, you know, the idea that they don't ever see this, it, it may not be the core data that they're leveraging, but they they know that this is generally happening, that, you know, if we see it, they see it. Yeah. So, I mean, I take the assumption that yeah. they see more than we see. Right. I mean, if we have it, they, That's they right. have it. So how, how do you think that they interpret this decline in retail sales? You know, they're always trying to break something, right? So is this breakage positive for them in terms of like saying, hey, our our mechanics are working? You know, what we're yeah. doing with interest rates are, are functionally breaking the economy to a place where we can – start to think about letting our foot off the pedal? Yeah, I, I think they, d I'm not sure they want to break something. I think they want to cut the um, growth of the economy yeah. to a point where it doesn't drive prices up so much. Yeah, but And that, retail is is probably the best indicator for that. Yeah. Right? Like, so that's, prices were really high because there was so much demand in large part. Right. And so I think the Fed would be happy that it has come down like this. Um, the thing that would break would be more like a credit event or some, the markets don't function. I don't think they would worry about the retail spending coming down. Mm -hmm. That's probably good. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to have the effect of reducing inflation. And it's certainly good from the high that it was at. I mean, that high is bad. Way too high. That's yeah. bad. Yeah. 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 So hopefully we'll see this uh, recover. What we wouldn't want to see is it keep going down. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that's the, that's the question. It's it's come down dramatically. All right. And then uh, you found this story on on banks and the Fed. Yeah. So the Fed uh, vice chair for supervision, they have a lot of roles there. Michael Barr. Uh, yeah. He, he testified in Congress and they are increasing the reserve requirements for banks. So the money that has to be retained and can't be lended out um, is being increased, which will provide more resiliency and also limit how much money banks can loan out. Uh, but then also importantly, they are rolling back the, the relaxation of the standards for the regional banks. So there's going to be about 70% about of banks are going to see more regulatory requirements, more capital they have to hold in reserve and not lend out. So this is our response to SVB. And, you know, ironically, this is a rollback of that which SVB lobbied for. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's going to, it's definitely going to reduce the amount of money small to medium businesses can borrow, especially if they're on the edge of credit worthiness. Banks are going to go to their yeah. really high credit borrowers that's right. and, and not loan that's or, right. or loan at a much higher interest rate through a subprime lender or someone. Yep. So this will have a additional kind of quieting effect on the economy, similar to their rate hikes. Maybe just for some of our um, listeners who don't uh, understand like how banks, how, fract how the fractional banking system yeah. works, like why does an increase in the reserves requirement mean less lending? So when they get deposits, when a bank gets deposits in, they can then loan out that money again. And the percent of money that they have to hold and not reloan is the reserve requirement. And so, um, but it's an iterative process, right? So they they loan it. So say I give a thousand, I deposit a thousand dollars at bank A. They can then loan out, say ninety percent of that. Yeah, nine hundred dollars. Yeah, nine hundred. They loan it to you, but typically they make you get a account, a checking account at their bank. So now, they have, the now they have so now they have nine hundred deposit nine hundred dollars of new deposits. It's not totally new, but but they get to count it as new deposits, and then they loan out ninety percent of that to someone else. And it's recursive, and, and it's recursive, and so you end up loaning out a a lot of the money, and so they're increasing that reserve ratio to dampen dampen that. Yeah, which is. Probably healthy in the long run. Not probably. It's healthy. It in the is long healthy. Run. Yeah. Um, 
in, in, in light of in light of the bank failure, specifically SVB, but like just the whole bank run. I mean, we're going to talk, I think, a little bit about reserves versus liquidity and, yeah. and what that issue was. But there is something to be said for larger reserves mean you have a bit more last reserve liquidity. Like you, you've got a little bit of more insurance before you have to call the FDIC because you're out of cash. Yeah. I mean, inherently, they'll have fewer borrowers yes. and more reserves. Yes. Um, and you'll be so, tighter on your credit requirements. Yeah. And so your likelihood to get paid back is higher. And, it's higher. Yeah. It's it's going to it's going to be hard on that kind of edge case borrower. Yep. A lot of our portfolio companies, as they mature and they get to cash flow positive and they're viable and growing, they would prefer to take money from a bank and not a venture equity investor because it's a lower cost of capital. That's going to be delayed, pushed out, or not happen as much. And so that'll that'll limit capex. It'll limit job growth. It'll limit the economy, basically. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I see it as, I mean, it's the Fed's job to regulate banks. They clearly need to pay attention to it, given what happened in March. And it's very similar to increasing the the interest rates. It's going to have a similar effect, I think. Okay. So this has has been a story we've talked about for a while. I actually, uh, I, I write a column for HFMA's yeah. uh, magazine, the Healthcare Finance Management Association, mm-hmm. uh, that I'm on the national board of. I write a, a biannual article for them uh, in the magazine called HFM. And the last one I wrote, because really because we've been talking about it so much, yeah. is about the connection uh, between the banking industry and the healthcare industry, and specifically how it's going to impact the innovation that the healthcare industry needs. Um, yeah, how and, it affects healthcare and in healthcare innovation. Exactly, and have talked about sort of the the potential of a credit event yeah. um, that could happen based on the rates and the loan to value issue that is bubbling up. Yeah, um, and how this is all going to change credit worthiness is going to change access to capital, going to change bankability even mm-hmm. um, for smaller companies, and how specifically in the healthcare industry, you know, startups we, we have a higher hurdle than we would in almost any other industry, not any other industry, but almost any other industry because we have to present as more mature because mm-hmm. the you know the risk management of the organizations we're selling into is just higher, right? Well, so, there's someone's life at stake. So yeah. like you can't you can't play with that like you might with a an internet toy thing. And there's also just higher compliance re- yeah. requirements, right? I mean, it's it's life at stake and also just legal peril, yeah. right? right? There's just, right. There's just right. literally more money is needed to back these companies. Yeah. And um, these banking struggles are not directly connected to sort of the pathway of innovation, but they're they're basically indirectly you know, connected. Yeah. And so the only reason why I'm sharing this is just because, A, this article is live and, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll put a link to it in the show notes. But also, uh, it's been pretty well received. You know, mm-hmm. um, several of the pretty top ranking CFOs uh, at health systems around the country have reached out to oh, me really? yeah. okay. uh, around the article and said it was it was it was spot on, which actually I wasn't that happy about because I'm, I'm talking about pretty bad situation yeah, in, right. in the article. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the point of this podcast was to force you and I to, to dig into these things and really learn about it. And then this is an outgrowth of that, where now you know this space, so you're writing about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so let's let's continue on and let's talk a little bit about um, the markets, because I think the, the we, we kind of have two different stories. And we talk a little a lot about how venture trails the public markets, mm-hmm. right? The public markets pricing mechanisms are real time, right? You know, it's very, very transparent. And so Last year, this time, I mean, it's crazy that we're in July of 23, yeah. right? But July of 22, the stock market started tanking, right? right? Because Fed's raising rates. Everyone's realizing this is the beginning of a long process. Bonds are going to go up. And the stock market started to proactively price in what it believed was going to happen overall to the, to damage the valuation of equities, right? Yeah. So the way before it happened in the venture market, we were – we were recording videos and talking to our portfolio companies right. and trying to message to founders, hey, this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. And then it wasn't really until the first quarter of this year. I think SVB was a huge catalyst and a wake-up call mm-hmm. for everybody. But it wasn't really until the first quarter of this year that the founders started to really understand, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, our companies are worth like something in the universe of two-thirds to a third of what they were previously, right? Right. 
Um, but what's happening in the stock market lately is it's been ripping. Um, you know, this year and, and particularly uh, the Nasdaq has been ripping. Yeah. And so, like, when we were talking about what we we're going to talk about for this show this week, I was just like, hey, can you unpack the Nasdaq? Like, it's, right. you right. know, it's running through the roof. What's going on here? It's it's, it's either crazy or it is sort of seeing something that um, I don't see. Yeah. Well, well you, I mean, we, we know there are a couple of uh, bits of narrative, right? So... Uh, there's AI, yeah. and that obviously bumps NVIDIA, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and also and Microsoft, and, Microsoft yeah. and, and Google, yeah, a little bit, right? Um, and then there's also the storyline about uh, companies getting their act together in terms of cutting the fat, getting more lean, yeah. getting more yeah, focused, they, focusing on on their core business, uh, uh, on their core business lines. Meta is pretty much the poster child for that. Mm -hmm. um, has totally crushed, you know, earnings. Yeah, uh, for, I think the last two quarters. Yeah. Uh, after those 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 uh, tactics that they put in place. So we we know that the individual company narratives that are driving why Meta or NVIDIA or these other companies. But yeah, I, but I, I think, think it depends on the um, your view of where the next 12 months is going. Right. Right. So like if the Fed is able to pull off uh, what's called a soft landing, meaning they they sort of slow down the economy and get get inflation in control, but they don't really break anything. They don't make uh, a, a deep recession. It just sort of slows down and we all take a breath, inflation comes down, and then we slowly grow in a beautiful, you know, G GDP of 4%, inflation at 2%. Um, that's the scenario where the stock market does really well. And that's currently the stock market's uh, bet and at least the narrative they are pushing yeah right yeah that's right yeah yeah i mean and it's you know you make more money in wall street when the stock market's going up yeah that's right so um i look when you were talking about the nasdaq earlier this week i went and looked at the weighting like you know both the nasdaq and the s p are market cap weighted which means that when you buy them you don't buy an equal part like your money doesn't get spread across the hundred companies in the Nasdaq no, 100. It's, it's based on what, it's, it's what based they on make how up. big the, how it's big a, they a, are. Kind of a pro rata. Yeah, it's a, you, yeah, it's a pro rata. And yeah. then the S&P 500 is 500, but it's the same deal. It's mm. just, it's the the number one biggest if you put $1000 in gets a lot of your money and then it goes down pro rata. Right. And so I I went and pulled and it's on the screen here, but for those that are listening, the top 10 holdings in both. And it's two things were interesting. One there's a lot of concentration in the top 10. And so the NASDAQ is 100 stocks and the top 10, and, and Google has, Alphabet has two of the top 10 spots. So it's really the top nine. Right, it's really the top nine. That's 59% <laughs> of the value of the index. It's amazing. Which is crazy to me. Um, but that's what it is right now. And then S&P is 30%. Of course, S&P has 500. 500. That's even worse. It, it's worse. as Yeah, it's, yeah. it's less... Um, it's more concentrated. Yes, less, more concentrated. Less, yes. Uh, but what I was sort of expecting that's why that's why I ran this. I expected it to be highly concentrated. What I was really almost shocked about is that it's the same damn names. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> if you think you're going to buy, I'm going to buy an index of the S and P 500, and I'll buy a Nasdaq too, and that'll be all tech, and then the S and P 500 will be more but basic businesses. It's the same companies that you're buying. And I'm not, I didn't know that. Like two days ago, I didn't know that. And so one, they're highly concentrated. And two, they're kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Um, and so when we think about the stock market ripping and, and specifically people talk about the NASDAQ, they've been mostly talking about the NASDAQ ripping. Yeah. And then they're saying the S&P is performing very well. Right. Yeah. Um, but when the NASDAQ is 60% made up of nine companies and the top seven of those nine are Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Tesla, and, and Alphabet. Right. Well, 
I think we understand why. It's like there have been great stories for each one of those companies. Apple's yeah. now a $3 trillion company. Tesla's charging network uh, is now going to be the standard for right. all of the other EV companies that are out there, right? So now they're going from being a car company to a network company. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about Meta. Uh, Alphabet's doing really, really well right now. I mean, it's just it makes more sense. But that concentration is insane, right? So the the swings that can happen in the stock market are largely predicated on these seven tech companies. Yeah. And I think the um, the narrative is is what you said. I think that's exactly right. And so the, the uh, people believe that AI is going to be incredibly successful. There will never be any bumps in the road and it's going to be to the moon. And that might be true. Well, they think they think but, it's going to fix inflation. Yeah, right. And so that's a great narrative. It might be true. It might not be true. But it sells stock right now. Right. <laughs> um, but go go to the next slide because I I started uh, trying to unpack, um, you know, where is this valuation coming from? Is it earnings? I mean, you said Meta. Meta has done really well. Yes. And. I mean, a lot of these tech companies are highly profitable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I couldn't find the NASDAQ. But uh, JP Morgan has a really good slide that I'll try to talk through. But again, it's worth looking at the video uh, where back to 96. So th this is not a, uh, the last two months. Right. Back to 1996, the concentration of the S&P 500, which again, is almost mirrors NASDAQ. So I think it's pretty relevant. Yep. It is that. They, so they did it on June 30th. I did mine like two days ago. So it's slightly different. But on June 30th, it was 32%, 31.7. That's the highest it's ever been. Um, and we kind of know that. We've already talked about that. Yeah. But the interesting part is the earnings is <laughs> really low. Or maybe average. Yeah, average. It, it's, it's not um, the lowest it's ever been. It's, but it's 10 not percentage high. points different from the market cap. Yes. Waiting. And so the question is are these tech uh tech mostly large cap stocks are they kind of demonstrating what the entire market will experience over time meaning that valuations are going to be high because they have earnings power and growth because of ai and the fed steered us to a soft landing and everything is working perfectly maybe and in that case the entire market would do well. Our portfolio would do well. Everything would be good. We'll all be happy. Um, or is there something else going on around the the multiples and the narrative just around these kind of story stocks? And there's going to have to be a reckoning there. Like So either the entire market is going to kind of shift up or there's going to be some kind of correction in these 10 names or something in the middle. Right. Um, I, while this is a, this, I think this is a great chart and I think it's important to ask this question. I think most people in our world will say that market cap relative to the earnings contribution is deserved, um, based on the relative performance of these companies against so many other companies, mm -hmm. right. That are either pretty much putting along kind of just flat and not really growing much and constrained mm -hmm. for whatever regulatory reason or whatever CapEx reason or whatever OpEx reason there may be, or the myriad of companies that are going out of business, bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. um, many of which are on the public markets, right? Um, or real estate or brick and mortar retail, right? So it's like, I, I think there is a relativity that at least people in our industry in the VC space would sort of say it's possible that market cap is not even um, what it should be. You know, it's it's possible if you're really sort of playing this out, the market cap should be larger relative to the earnings contribution. So, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I can't predict the future, but I, I think that would be the that would be the innovation community, VC industries, you know, response to this to this graph yeah i mean i think that there's a there's a have and a have not kind of approach to that narrative that i i kind of agree with google meta microsoft nvidia they have 
technology assets that a lot of other companies don't have. And that, you know, in America, that is rewarded. That's that's great. Other companies need to get their act together and figure out a way to respond. A lot of healthcare companies can't grow that fast, can't have those assets because they it's a it's more of a service. It's it's harder to scale healthcare. Um so I think that's certainly true. It also is a fear of mine. I don't have facts for it, but it's just a fear of mine that this narrative requires there to be a soft landing and there not to be some major credit problem. And I see a lot of potential credit problems out there. Yeah. Yeah. I I, th- I think I think it will be a lot to track over the back half of the year. And so we'll have plenty to talk about. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, gonna, I it's an ongoing story. I can't possibly make sense of it, but um, I do think that the AI narrative accrues broadly across these companies, even to Tesla. I think mm-hmm. AI accrues yes. to, to them as well. Um, I think that AI equaling lowering the cost of labor as a whole is a very stock market friendly narrative. Mm-hmm. And while we've talked about how AI is something that basically anyone can spin up because these large language models can be easily cloned, what we're learning or relearning or I mean, remembering I, is that distribution is king, right? Yes. You know, Meta. I mean, threads. Is, I was about to say, yeah. Meta puts, you know, I don't know, 20 engineers in a room for nine weeks. Yeah. And they release a Twitter killer. Literally, like, I haven't seen anybody really talk about this, but literally, they call the app threads. Which is at least the colloquial word for stringing together multiple tweets. They okay, literally right. took a, a Twitter term, named their app after it, and a hundred million users in what forty eight hours, something, yeah. something stupid like that, Incredible. some ridiculous amount of time. So distribution, the the, the distribution yeah. power of those seven companies is just done. It's just unparalleled. It just is. It's just you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but I there's no question. Just they are leveraging distribution in a way that is really powerful. But I, I also was uh, thinking about this in a different frame, which is uh, I think it's really interesting to to consider Meta and Microsoft. Okay, so like Microsoft, I think Meta is the Microsoft of the 1990s. Right, so Microsoft started they were they had a very dominant market position. Yeah. And they started just cloning things and doing, oh, you have a browser, we're gonna we're gonna do yeah, that. Right, right, we'll right, we'll right, just right. put everything <laughs> in our in our Windows yeah, system. Yeah. And they they were successful until they got so big that they got sort of slapped down and in, in, in the penalty box for a right. while. Yeah. And now they have gone through 15, 20 years where they're now being I think really innovative and and aggressive and trying to turn into a growth company again. They really weren't a growth company for a while. And Meta seems like they're at the opposite phase of that. Like they were incredible as far as innovation invention at first. But now that they sort of, you know, they they bought Instagram, yep. they are cloning Twitter and that will be successful but but it's not going to be like a breakout new thing. It's sort of monetizing their existing platform. Well, I, I mean, I think that's why I think that's why this this whole weighting of market cap versus earnings contribution thing is such an interesting thing to look at because um there's so many subscale industries for those companies, maybe Nvidia aside, but at least the software based mm-hmm. ones. For them to eat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Meta can eat Twitter. Yeah. And, you know, Microsoft, look, I mean, there's a reason why this Activision thing is such a huge story, right? You know, it's because of Call of Duty. Right. You know, it's because Microsoft, if Microsoft gets their hands on Call of Duty, like, they could eat the console business, that like the, you could distill all the first person shooters to Call of Duty, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Effectively, and if they manage to get it, and you know, I think they're going to. It looks like it, it, all, all of the signs. The UK are pointing, is the last. Yeah. Everything's pointing to them getting it right, and and it's like 
what what they're turn what these companies are turning into are incredible M and A and distribution machines. You know where they you know these subscale th- companies right you know the whole gaming industry right now it started where everyone was talking about the the publishers, but it. You know, that's over. It's now yeah. the platforms, right? It's Microsoft and Apple. Right. That's who you care about in the gaming world because they have yeah, the Sony's distribution. Sony's still, still around, right? No? I mean, well, yeah. look. So, I mean, let's talk about it. I yeah. think Sony had a big issue, which was they made the best console ever created in PS5. Mm-hmm. Supply chain fell down. No yeah. one's got one. Yeah. Like, I know like three people who have one. So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe they maybe they are losing it. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, I mean, they're, 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 are they in the game? Yes, they're in the game, but they're not at the level mm-hmm. of a Microsoft or an Apple, right? You yeah. know, in the scale and the distribution and the capabilities. And, you know, both Microsoft and Apple have stores in, in every city. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. beautiful stores where you can go visit. So we're, we're just talking about a, a new era of really it's interesting. It's like the power law is is really taking place in the stock market. It's really yes. winner take all in the stock market right now. Um and, and again, if we're just sort of comparing that back to the point of the show being about healthcare, um, you know, as we, when we compare that to healthcare, this was this was why we had the whole discussion about the A16Z thing. It's like there's really no close analogy to this in healthcare. Right. Um to to what to what these organizations are able to do relative to even a United Health Group. Right, you know, even a United Health Group that's a you know incredible juggernaut of an organization, still generally pretty small in their market share and the relative areas of 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 business lines that they're in. You yeah, know? I mean, I think the the sort of the entire question for our firm and for this podcast is how quickly can we digitize healthcare, and what subsectors of healthcare can can be digitized today. And then how, what does the regulation allow and how do you scale that over time? I mean, I think in 10 years, healthcare will be much more digitized than it is now. Um, but it but it's much harder. People's much harder. life is at stake. It's re- highly regulated. The federal government pays for half of it. So unlike other markets where you can just like go off and go around the, the federal government, you, you can't do that because they, they pay for half of everything. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break and uh, flip it to Doug to talk about Jumpstart Foundry. Thanks, guys, for the opportunity to talk about our pre-seed fund, Jumpstart Foundry. My name is Doug Edwards, CEO of Jumpstart Health Investors, the parent company of Jumpstart Foundry. We're so excited to be able to talk about uh, early stage venture investing, certainly the need for us to change the crazy world of healthcare in the United States. We are spending 20% of our GDP north of four trillion dollars a year on healthcare with suboptimal outcomes. Jumpstart Foundry exists to help us find and identify and invest in innovative companies that are going to make a difference in healthcare in our country. Every year, Jumpstart Foundry invests a fund, raises a fund, and deploys that across 30, 40, 50 assets every year, allowing ease of access for our limited partners to invest to help us make something better in healthcare. Some of the benefits of Jumpstart Foundry is there's no management fees. We deploy all the capital that's raised every year in the fund. We find the best and brightest, typically around single digit percentage of companies that apply for funding from Jumpstart. And we invest in the most incredible, robust, innovative solutions and founders in the United States. Over the last nine years, Jumpstart Foundry has invested in nearly 200 early stage, pre-seed stage companies in the country. Through those most innovative solutions that Jumpstart Foundry invests in, we also provide great returns and a great experience for our limited partners. We partner with AngelList to administer the fund, making that ease of access, not only with low minimums, but the ease of investing in venture much better. We all know that healthcare is broken. Everyone deserves better. Come alongside us with Jumpstart Foundry, invest in making the future of healthcare better and make something better in healthcare. Thank you guys. Now back to the show. All right, we're back. So uh, in, in your show notes, you <laughs> you had this as the third topic and I was reading now, I think you had it framed as uh, obesity is is a, a key comorbid feature of, uh, yeah. of diseases. Yeah. And I was like, duh. Like, who? Right, that's obvious. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. like, yeah. Uh, okay, that's really a topic for us to discuss. <laughs> and then you linked to the story and I was like, oh, 
Got it. Yeah. So, uh, again, for those who are listening and not watching, I've got a Wall Street Journal story up on the screen. Uh, it was published on July 7th by uh, David Weiner, and the headline is, Obesity Drugs Won't Starve These Other Potential Blockbusters. Yeah, it's kind of a funny title. Yeah. I think it is the opposite of that. That's what I, that, yeah. that's why I wanted to say what the title was. Right. So, so go ahead, Vic. Like, like just... How did you first of all, how did you come across the story and then how did you read it and really get to the point where I was like, my mind is totally blown about this? Well, so the the subtitle is what got my attention, which is, um, you know, a bunch of fatty liver treatments have been doing really well, been on tears, what it says. Right. Until some of the Eli Lilly results spooked people. And that that kind of is interesting. So Eli Eli Lilly has one of the um Obesity drugs, and uh, I'm not going to say it right. Ret- retritude, is that how you say it? Retritude. Retritude. Yeah, retritude. But I mean, yeah. there's three or four of these. They're they're uh, being you know they came out for diabetes treatment and then have been used off label for just pure weight loss, and they're really successful. They're very expensive and they have to be injected, which you know sort of limits. Not everyone's comfortable with that, right? But I, I have friends, I'm sure you do, that have lost 50 pounds. I mean, they lost a ton of weight. Well, and also, like, that to be injected, but so does insulin. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, not going to be that big of a barrier for, you know. Yeah, right. For some A lot of people. Type, right. Yeah, so um, the reason it's it's interesting to talk about here, we all know that Ozempic and Retitude, and there's going to be more. This These drugs do reduce weight gain. They do reduce appetite. They help you lose weight yep. very quickly. Yep. Um, that's pretty well established. I think, as you mentioned, it's sort of like an obvious statement to say that maybe every chronic disease, but certainly fatty liver disease, is comorbid with, with obesity. Almost most people that have chronic disease, certainly they have fatty liver disease, also are overweight. And the study that uh, Lily... Uh, was conducting the drug that is supposed to help you with weight loss also has significant impact, positive impact on fatty liver disease. And so the question for, for I want to get your comment on is, might we only need these couple drugs to treat all chronic care? And how many, how many biotech pharma products in the pipeline should just be abandoned? We don't need. So, um, I have to state my bias before we start talking about okay. this, which is, you know, I'm one of these uh, Peter Atia guys, right? Yeah. So yeah. I like listen to his podcast, I read his books, and all this other mm-hmm. kind of stuff, right? And and I I, you know, I take my own health into my own hands insofar as I live my life like an athlete, right? Like I I train like an athlete, I compete I mean, in jiu-jitsu, sort, yeah, of, right. sort, of, sort of all that stuff. Well, I mean, I don't get paid, and so I think you know, yeah, when, you're not a professional, right? Athlete. I think if yeah. you don't get paid, people are like, oh, whatever, you're playing athlete. But I mean, if they actually saw my schedule, like what I do on a day to day, week to week basis, uh, you know, it's it's yeah, one I, thing for me to go on a jog. It's different when you get in a jujitsu ring and have to fight someone. It, yeah, so, so, I'm, so I so I do this a lot, right? And and what what doing all this has done is it's really made me focus on first principle stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think Peter Atiyah is really great at, is breaking down things to first principles and saying, these are the the biggest causes of death, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and these are the things that indicate that you're on your path to this cause of death, right? right? And so... And there's only, I mean, in the book I read, he had five that that account for, I don't know, 90% of people's death. Yeah, and ASCVD is like, the yeah. top one. The, that's the that's the one that kills most people. Mm-hmm. You know, people think about it as some type of heart disease, coronary right. artery disease of, of some form. Yeah. But you know, that's the that's the one that gets you. And I'm currently listening to his audiobook where he's talking about healthcare 3.0. Uh it's called Outlive, is the name okay. of the book. Yeah. Um, where he's talking about fatty liver disease. Okay. Yeah. And and how literally when he was, I think he was a resident. This was when he started to sort of realize that this was what he needed to focus his whole life's work on, right? Was as he started to see 
over and over again. The, the, fat, the, fatty like the liver. first principle causes yes, for that. Yes, the yeah. first principle cause of all this stuff, right? Yeah. Of all these people who come in and they're at this point where you basically can't save them. Yeah. Right? It's too late. They I mean, all yeah. have fatty livers. Mm -hmm. They all have fatty livers, right? And so, um, and, and, and I think he actually said, I, I can't remember if it's if it's uh, AST. Is it AST or ALT? It's 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 it's, it's one of the the the, the liver um, biomarkers. I can't remember okay. which one it is, but basically one of those. He said this this biomarker is like just a massive indicator, early indicator that you need to get to work on your obesity mm -hmm. and use exercise and diet and nutrition and all this other kind of stuff. So when you when you said that this Eli Lilly uh, new drug is starting to show results of lowering fatty liver, <laughs> you know, syndrome. Yeah, I was like. That is that is a massive, massive potential situation, right? Because you're right. There is a world in which these obesity drugs just decrease all this chronic disease that we've been dealing with, you know, that we've been trying to figure out how to get people through, you know, their lifestyle and the foods they eat yeah. and their exercise and all these other things. We've been trying to figure out how to get them healthy and really with terrible results up until this point well g behavior change is really hard like it's really versus hard. taking a shot once a day and then i'm not really that hungry and and here we have a pharmacological approach that really i mean this this could be massive this could be massive you know yes. and i think the thing that that totally escaped me and i feel so dumb for this is as we've been hearing about the obesity drugs, you know, I had just defaulted to thinking about appearance, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And not and not really thinking about the comorbidity. I mean, I thought about it, but it wasn't until you say the words fatty liver. That's when I go, oh, this is way beyond appearance. This is like could be fundamentally fixing America's problem. I mean, you know, I mean, and, and let's I, just, let's I'm, just I'm not that excited about ascribing that to a pharmacological approach but i mean we've been unsuccessful thus far right so i mean pe people are people are dying right people are, people dying. are dying of fatty liver they're dying of end-stage renal disease they're dying of heart heart disease they're yes. dying of copd all of those and more all of those would be massively improved or cu or cured effectively yes. cured where you're not going to die of that anymore you're dying of something else right if you lose your BMI gets down to 23 and it's at 32 right now, 35 right now. So just that one. And that's why the stocks for these fatty liver treatments all cratered. Yeah. But that's going to be just the beginning. That's people, just the beginning. Pe right. People, people are just connecting it directly. They're they, just they, seeing they see that the, they, one. Yeah. They see fatty liver. Okay. Let's go knock down the, right. the price of these fatty liver things. But it's like, no, 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 no. This it's is way every bigger. Chronic this, 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 every chronic disease. Every chronic disease. Well, not every chronic disease. It's every chronic disease that's directly tied to fatty liver. So the reason why I say it, because it's not like um like autoimmune, right? Yes. So oh, yeah. it does. It doesn't. Uh, it, it's it, every it, chronic disease that is comorbid with weight gain. Yes. Which is many of them. Which is a lot. Which yeah. is a lot in America. That's especially. why I had in my in the show notes that um which was obvious, but um but I think it's going to be impactful, and we don't know. No one knows. We don't know how this is going to get rolled out and the impact. I mean, there are some side effects it, and it's kind of expensive, but payers will start funding it. Look, I, I guess all I'm saying is it's early, but it is something to watch. And it's mm -hmm. something to watch as an investor, right? I mean, this yeah. automatically makes me much more leery of doing anything in the diabetes, you know, type two diabetes world, especially if it's like a chronic care management solution. I'm like, uh, I mean, look, there, it, it's already a flooded market in that space. So, yeah, you know, there, there were already good reasons to to steer clear of it. But really, but you, to, to think you, about the, the idea that, might that go away. Yeah. Yeah. Pharma might take care of this. Right. And that is that's a big, big, big deal. And, it, and it'd be incredible. Yeah. For, for society. I, I'm I'm way more excited now. About this, yeah. About, I mean, about I didn't, this, I, this, this I was just like you. I didn't care about Ozempic and Ret2, whatever it is, because I don't know. I mean, it makes yeah. I, I was looking at it as an image uh, vanity thing. Yeah. 
But it's very different if you start treating all these chronic diseases. Totally, totally. So anyway, like pretty exciting, actually, I think. Yeah. You know, just the idea that we may have a path to help so many people that have basically struggled with with with, with lots of suggestions and recommendations and prescriptions for things that, that you know, I, either their body is resisting those things or for whatever lifestyle reasons or or socioeconomic reasons, they can't actually do these things. It's like the idea that we may have a pharmacological solution, that it's just about adherence. And now we get you out of the, the death trap, yes. right? That is diabetes. That is ASCVD. I mean, like that's so it's, it's all, exciting. Um, it's all interrelated, right? Like, yeah. If you lose some way now you can walk a little bit easier you don't get out of breath so much now you can sort of maybe enjoy small meals i, I think there's going to be probably a lot of different this these are the first couple of drugs that came out right there's going to be a lot of other ones that maybe aren't injected or you can titrate down or different options but yeah it's pretty exciting okay well anyway i'm really glad you pointed this out because yeah. this I'm going to spend more time researching this this group yeah. of drugs and and getting smarter about it. I mean, I don't want to get too excited before I understand all of the implications of it, mm -hmm. but just to see that it is impacting fatty liver in 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 early findings. Yeah, that's a, that's a really big deal. That is a really big deal. And I don't know the pathway. The journal, you know, is not scientific. They didn't describe the pathway, but I can't think of a pathway that wouldn't also affect other diseases of of obesity. Yeah. Okay. All right. Final story. Um, not so not so good news, uh, but sort of getting back to our winner take all and smaller companies are really struggling. And it's it's so difficult. So, okay, just a, a real quick segue before we dig into this yeah. Rite Aid story. So, so I saw um, a headline uh, about Bob Iger uh, getting his contract as CEO with Disney extended to okay. 2026. And like an immediate opinion piece was Bob Iger is going to be the CEO of Disney till 2026. Uh, that's enough time that, for him to sell the company. And it's like, I just, you know, thinking about Disney as a small company that yeah. you should be thinking about selling. Like, that's what I mean. Like, all of these media companies are going to get eaten yeah. by the big tech guys. Like, that's where we're headed, unfortunately, right? And so, it's you know... When we hear Apple is now a $3 trillion company, that means all these other companies that are not growing at that rate are just by virtue of relativity becoming small, right? And that's it. the reason why I segue it is because, you know, Rite Aid is, it may be going bankrupt, okay? Yeah. And this, this, is, this is a big deal. We normally are talking about hospitals that are struggling to stay open. Yeah. Uh, but- Goodness gracious! If if drugstore, you know, if drugstores are not just as important to many communities, right? Yeah. So, um, Rite Aid it has twenty three hundred stores in the U.S. and they have a bunch of debt. The reason this story came up now is they they attempted to refinance their debt that's due in twenty twenty five, and they failed. I they couldn't get it done. I just heard yesterday about another story of a company that got an extension to refinance their mm -hmm. debt last year. And I think we may be hearing about them in a month. So if we do, yeah. I will, if it comes public, I will then say, remember on this episode when I said this, yeah. but this whole refinancing debt and inability to do it, this is what we're talking well, it about. It goes back to the this first is story. Literally I mean, what we're talking about. The the banks cutting back on their ability to lend to less than perfect borrowers yes. affects Rite Aid, affects the company you're talking about, I think. And so they failed at that. They have no plan of how they're going to – they can't pay it back. They can't refinance it. And there are all these opioid um, settlements, and CVS and Walgreens have settled – because they just wanted to put it behind them and be done. CVS paid five something billion dollars. Right Aid doesn't have any money to do that. And so they are in trouble. They've already tried to sell themselves twice. And both times it got uh, squashed. The first time they were selling to Walgreens, I think it was Walgreens, FTC blocked it. And the second time was Albertsons and the shareholders 
didn't want it. So there's a real question of, is this set of 2,300 stores going to exist? And and then do we do we need it? There's some that probably are in communities where they're the only one, certainly not all of them. Anyway, so it, it's a it's a huge asset. They're probably the second biggest um, after Walgreens. Um, right, it was right across the street from our old office. Yeah, yeah. We used to go there at least once a week. Yeah, for something. Right. Um, I think that was the store where you know someone where we know that someone that we know went and got their blood pressure checked. Yeah, and, and, then, ended, the, and it ended up being like a big emergency. Yeah. Right. Um, so like, and, and the fact that she could just walk across the street and get checked, I mean, not that she wouldn't have maybe ever gone, but it was, it definitely helped her get the care more quickly. Totally. Totally. Well, well you know, because otherwise we weren't, we didn't know what the issue was. Right. right? I mean, right. she's not feeling well. Okay, fine. Then no, oh, the blood pressure is like through the roof. Okay. We know what that is. Let's, yeah. let's go deal with that. So I think there's just, uh, you know, more and more clear signs that, um, Access to care is going to be impaired as we continue to go through this, you know, financial churn uh, that is banking related, that is um, healthcare margin related. Mm -hmm. It's 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 hitting from so many different angles, right? Um, we talk a lot about r rural onesie twosie hospitals. Yeah. We talk a lot about the nonprofits that don't have a health plan attached or are not academic medical centers generating grant income. Um, but this adds a whole other dimension to it, I think. Yeah, there's, n there's no question. I think as we go through the soft landing, hard landing, various scenarios, no matter what, right, scale and balance sheet strength are going to be critical. Massive. And Rite Aid doesn't have it. Um, and I didn't get a chance to put it up because it came out too quickly. But Acadia is a, a big behavioral health platform headquartered here. And I, I have friends there. It's a great well-run company, they had a lawsuit. Uh, they just were handed a judgment of four hundred eighty million dollars um, for treatment of a of a child, and they, I don't know how they're going to pay that. So they they're also in trouble. Um, so the, there's going to be the, this group of um, healthcare companies and every kind of company that they don't have a strong enough balance sheet. Something out of the blue happens. An opioid settlement. I mean, Rite Aid certainly dispensed opioids, but I I have trouble saying that they're the cause of it. Right. Right. So, but they, right. but they are grouped into that. Right. Acadia does incredible work, and in addition, they they were found guilty of hurting this one patient. There's a lot of patients there, yeah. but that if you don't have enough uh, resiliency, enough balance sheet strength, enough scale. With the way the Fed has the the banks now, you can't. There's no real way to recover from a, a bump in the road, kind of. So, I mean, I don't know how we summarize this show. Uh, this is kind of a bummer note to end on. Um, maybe we should have thought about rearranging this a little bit. Maybe we should have put we this have before put the, the Ozempic stuff, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I just think we're in this un unpredictable moment with lots of indicators, but they seem to be indicating different things. And I think that's why you're talking mm -hmm. about the multiple scenarios, the soft landing, mm -hmm. the hard landing, which is, would really be, I think, principally due to a credit yeah, uh, some, event. Whether it's commercial real estate or it's something like Rite Aid and then a bunch of things around Rite Aid going, I mean, these things are all intertwined. Right? Right. So you don't know exactly what causes it, but I, I mean, I, I'm a, we're VCs, right? So I believe in the U.S. Uh, innovation economy to to sort of pull us out of this. Did you hear that? Um, that Bed Bath and Beyond is now the name of Overstock.com. No, they rebranded it. I knew they bought all the assets. Yeah, so that they could so they could take the brand. Yes. Huh. Interesting. Yes. No, but I mean, but this is like this is the question. Are all these brick and mortar institutions going to just become brand IP that yeah, lives yeah. online? Like, is that what is that is that what's going to happen? We're just going to liquidate all this stuff, you know, hollow out our our physical footprint, right? 
and just shift it all online. I mean, it's a real question when you look at the when you look at everything we just talked about from a stock market perspective. Mm-hmm. You know how it's one thing for the for the Nasdaq to be concentrated with tech companies, but the S and P is not a tech. Right. Stock market. Right. It's the top 500 stocks. It's supposed to be the, the sort of proxy for the whole economy. That's right. That's right. So when when out of the top 10, the only thing you, you that's not a tech company is Berkshire. Right. I mean. Yeah. And then the thing that um, I'm trying to think through is the impact on everyday people, blue collar people, even middle class people that mostly pay for things with their job. And don't have a huge stock market portfolio. Um, the jobs are being largely automated. Yeah. Overstock is going to, or now Bed Bath and Beyond is going to hire fewer people than the old Bed Bath and Beyond hired. And just so as a society, we need to figure out how are we are we going to do universal basic income, or what are we going to do so that people can can continue their life. I don't know there's a lot of questions. A lot of but, questions. <laughs> but I think um a lot of technology questions. and venture and you know keep listening because yeah. uh we'll figure out something and then try to bring it to you. Yeah. Okay, next week I'm on vacation so Vic will bring uh in a special guest and um we're excited about that. I'm excited about a break. I <laughs> yeah. haven't had a break all year so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, you're, but, you're uh, going to the San Juan Islands, right? That's going to be amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah um, I have a, I have a I'm in discussions with a guest right now. I think I'm excited about it. I need to get the logistics worked out. If you lock them in, it'll be good. Yeah. Um, Well, anyway, thanks for lining up a great show, and uh, I will see you in two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye, man.